First of all, a big welcome to October Gallery and tonight, court performance. Tonight's performance will be done by Pandora's Box. Now that could mean most anything, but I would like to describe to you a bit of what it does mean. This is a group of composers and musicians, John Kinney, Emily White, and Miguel Tantos, and they have performed throughout the UK and internationally. I learned of John Kinney through my dear friend, John Whiting, long ago, who's been here recording these concerts since 1979. And John Kinney I was especially interested in because he plays this old horn with a boar's head, the Carnix. Now they won't be performing the Carnix tonight, but I will tell you a bit of what they will do. They will be tonight performing a trio of hidden delights, combining music of the late medieval and Renaissance periods with contemporary composition, improvisation, poetry, and physical theater. Playing violin, trombone, sack butt. Now I had to do special research about sack I had never heard of that word before, and it means sake, bute, to bring in and push out. And one of these instruments, which you will see later, is called a sackbutt, and even a bicycle frame. And you will listen to the trio weave a subtle tapestry of words, vocals, and music, poetry of love and intrigue from the courts, pilgrim roots, cloisters of medieval and Renaissance Europe to gritty modern sounds. They will be celebrating music from the Shanti Codex by Hildebrand van Bingen, Benjamin Britten, and the musicians themselves, John Kinney, Miguel Tantos, and Emily White, Rachel Stott, Susima Yoshida, and they will be inspired by Chaucer, Shakespeare, and Petrarch. So watch out. <laughs> We're going to open the lid of Pandora's box now. Thank you. 
a pocket full of mercury, a cup of cold tea, a whiff of burnt toast. Antique, untuck, unthought, unthought. The Madeleine remains mundane. C'est pourquoi le temps reste perdu. something old um, and but you know we what one of the things I found uh, was you know that um, this certain uh, music from from the early period this is 14 15th century that was very ex experimental and we thought that would be very interesting for, for us because we we are into um, something more than something new something you know avant-garde but actually um, finding music from 
the 14th century being uh, avant-garde, being very <laughs> experimental, was you know a great discovery for us. So um, we chose these three pieces from the Chantilly Codex, which was music um, that was find, found in in France, and and yes, and we you know we really like the the, the music and also um, this music. Um, is, is, it was very beautifully uh, presented because, uh, for example, the second uh, piece, uh, La, La Art de Melodie, um, the, the, the music, the writing of the music forms a harp, or, you know, the, I think it's uh, Belbon Charles as well, forms the, uh, the, the shape of a heart. So it's a very beautiful and very uh, poetic way of writing music, which you know, um, was uh, perfect for this Pandora's box. So Dugard is the first one, uh, Lac de Melody second, and Belle Bonchage will be the third item. And we, we do have, we have friends in the audience primed, uh, and they know what these things are. Obviously, those were trombones. Um, <laughs> <laughs> these are Renaissance trombones, or as we call them in, uh, called them in the British Isles, sackbuts. In fact, English humour took over, and they did eventually get called shagbolts. <laughs> 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 the, uh, the French sacoboots, the sacoboots, in Germany they've always had the same name, Posaune, trombone. In Italy, always the same name, trombone, trombus pizzata, broken trumpet. It's a broken trumpet. <laughs> so, so basically they look quite different, although it's the same animal quite clearly. They feel very different to us to play, they're joyful to play, and um, I hope you'll notice the difference in the sound quality as we do play. <clears throat> Thank you. 
Emily is uh, a particular sort of nutcase, <laughs> um, because not only is she willing to play trombones and sackbuts all in the same concert, she also is willing to pick up her violin and play extraordinarily beautifully well on the rock violin. But in actual fact, she's not playing rock violin on this occasion, she's playing modern violin, but with a baroque bow, the short bow, which she'll show you in a moment. And as all of this is, in a way, also about time travel, we're mixing times up, we're being extremely <coughs> inauthentic. Uh, we're playing modern music on ancient instruments and ancient music on modern instruments, and we're just about to play something by possibly the first great female European composer of whose name we know. Uh, there will, of course, have been others, but we don't know them. Uh, Hildegard von Bingen, 11th century saint, poet, scholar, abbess, visionary, extraordinary, extraordinary woman she must have been. Also extraordinary because she lived to the ripe old age of 81 at a time when most people around were dying in their 30s and 40s. So she was obviously doing something right. Um, her poetry is so ecstatic, it borders on the dangerous for her time. The dangerous. Because her love of God, of Christ, her exultant spirituality is undoubtedly also sexual. And she expresses herself in extremely passionate language. Um, and so, Em, do you want to say anything about the, the fiddle? Maybe you've got it. You tune it up. Uh, you may notice, those of you that are used to violins, that the strings are tuned differently. I've tuned the a, uh, G string up to an A um, in preparation for the piece that follows this, which demands squadratura, which is the technical term for detuning one of the violin strings, but it works really neatly for this piece um, because we need a, a drone of a D and an A, and also you can hear that the resonance of the top A is much more than usual because it's got a corresponding string that's sympathetically vibrating. So if we discovered by chance that this makes this piece um, sound even funkier. <laughs> Are we having a drum? Oh, yes, and <coughs> we need your help, ladies and gentlemen, um, because uh, we'd love this to be a whole choir of monks and nuns, nuns. of course. <laughs> nuns, uh, nuns. Well, she, she was quite into the monks. Anyway, um, so uh, we. <laughs> so, um, this. Can you all sing that note for me, please? And if anybody's feeling really dangerous, they could sing that one over the top of it. All of you sing that note. Ah. And now, you choose for yourself whether you want ah or ah. And you don't have to sing the same note all the time. You can bring it in, bring it out. Take a breath, please don't die. If you brought your wine up, take a sip. But basically, we're transporting ourselves to the Abbey of Bingham on the Rhine, somewhere around about 10 80 AD. <laughs> o Inge Spiritus, Laus Divisit, Qui in Timpanise, Vitais Omeratis. <laughs> Thank you. 
Eis Lucerna es de Sildegui. that since then she's moved on to uh, make an entire cycle of pieces. They're all based upon extracts from Homer's, uh, from the Odyssey. And in fact, a very particular translation of the Odyssey by George Chapman, who was writing in the early 17th century, and he made one of the first great English translations of the Odyssey. So there are how many how many sections has she um, done? It's work in progress, but I think she's yeah. done at least five completed um, stories. This is just the story of Scylla and Charybdis, and um, she is exploring this one. Um, she's using Scordatura <coughs> in the violin, but in the other ones she has mis um, missized instruments. So when um, sometimes uh, they have a giant bass sackbut and a tiny tiny piccolo violin and sometimes a giant tenor viola mm -hmm. and the tiny, 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 tiny cornetino being the voices of the sirens. A cyclops is the bass sackbut, of course. <laughs> and, um, yeah, so she's, um, she's developing this idea, but it came from this, as a gift, she wrote Sir and Charybdis because I returned a hat to her that she left somewhere. And she said, what can I do in return? I said, oh, write me a fanfare or something. And then she wrote this extraordinary piece. <laughs> One of the things that she discussed with me was she wrote a, a website to help composers writing for instruments, to know what's easy and what's hard for writing for young musicians, because <laughs> often composers don't know that they're writing very tricky things. So I explained that playing legato on the trombone was as hard as playing one finger legato on a string instrument, highly, highly technical, very demand, very hard to do smoothly or fast. And she went, hmm. She's put one finger legato for the violin to this piece. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm very grateful for that, Rachel. Thank you. I have to tell you, um, if, if I'm sure you're all familiar with the Odyssey, at least the name. You know that Odysseus was cast and wandering around with the Argonauts around the ancient seas, lost, had lots of wonderful adventures, a uh, lot of terrible adventures, and finally did get back home and uh, picked up with his wife and killed his enemies and so on. Uh, but the one of the most famous uh, incidents in the Odyssey is when um, the Argos escapes from the Sirens and Odysseus is lashed to the mast uh, to avoid being sucked into the Sirens' mm. lair. So they've escaped mm. this terrible uh, curse and then they have to pass through 
as we would now say, the Straits of Messina. So between Sicily and the North African shore, there are two great rocks, and the legend was that two sea monsters inhabited those rocks. They were clashing rocks, and the monsters that lived within them were both demigods who'd been transformed into hideous monsters, um, and they clashed against the rocks, and the monsters one, in fact, was the personification. Charybdis is the personification of a giant whirlpool. And Scylla is actually a 12-footed, six-headed beast that lives on a rocky crag that likes to tear passing mariners apart. So uh, here we have the representation of not only Odysseus, but also the sea itself. Odysseus is identified with the sea. And of course, Two ugly, great mm. rocks, flashing rocks, <laughs> typecast again. <laughs> so, having set that shore, imagine that Odysseus is sailing on, having escaped the siren's clutches. And now the storyteller begins to relate what happens next. Near these siren shores move two steep rocks, at whose feet lie and roar the black sea's cruel.
giant, wild fig tree, all curled about with ample leaves, beneath whose shades divine Charybdis sits and sups the black, black deeps. Thrice a day her pitch she drinks all dry, and thrice a day again up all she belches, baneful to sustain.
to, to finish this first half, <coughs> again we're going to play a very short piece um, based upon a poem of Rhymes. Uh, it's a haiku, it appears in the book, and, um, and I wrote this for Brian's birthday, which <coughs> was um, fortunately a good few months before he died, and um, I didn't know actually until this evening that this poem is on Brian's tombstone, which is rather lovely and also a little emotional. <laughs> staying open after the concert and we want to make sure that you patronise the bar. So we're only going to play one Bulgarian chant and uh, this is a language I can't pronounce so I'm going to make it sound good. Filik prokimen ne stravi litsa subego. That's total bullshit. <laughs> oh and I should also say um, you are not going to see this very often. You have now a trio of alto sack butts. Very unusual. <laughs> Thank you. 
into another set of poetically inspired pieces. Again, it's Brian's poetry, and this is a suite of music by Emily, um, and the suite is called The Turning Wheel. And the first piece is called Spring in an Unreal World. She comes to me in the morning like a verdant surprise of bird song. exploring another instrument, we can't play this in a trio. These, uh, these instruments are extremely expensive, these early instruments, and this is a, a masterpiece of the luthier's art that Emily is playing. It's called Miranda. <laughs> Anyone wants to take a closer look? Can we look? trike on eBay, like a big kid's tricycle with an electric motor. The third wheel says invalid. <laughs> My 
My neighbours think it's great fun. Carl took time out from gardening on a soft summer's evening to set up the brakes and the gears. hills with the dog in the basket, grin on her face, ears flying. It hasn't turned out that way. It's tricky riding a trike, and for this seeker of thrills on wheels, Three's one too many. Oh well, I gave it a go. But I know it's not for me. Better to sell it on now. Before the rust sets in. operation that he had and I didn't realize until I read this poem that uh, he was awake rather more awake than the anesthetist meant so <laughs> enjoy <clears throat> wheeled down through corridors down tunnels where no one follows Incommunicado. Taken from my next of kin. Under wraps. Don't know what's going on. Just letting it happen. No will to resist. Can hear discussion going on. Eyes can't open. Elsewhere, where? 
where it cannot scream. And all through it, slices penetrating.
pieces are by Miguel. And we actually have a guest to help. Yes, so um, a few years ago, um, we went to Spain uh, for a small tour in the north of Spain, where I'm from. And we did a series of concerts and master classes, and we worked with the students. It was a very nice um, week of um, music and wine and food. Um, but one of the things we did is a very nice collaboration with a poet from my hometown, who is actually very, you know, he's quite famous, um, you know, in, in Spain. Uh, and he used to be my uh, teacher at school, my math teacher, actually. But he was also, he is he's still alive, and he's also a poet and a, and a painter. He's a proper, you know, Renaissance artist, um, you know, and, and he, you know, we, I called him and said, look, we are going to go there on tour, would you like to do something? So he sent me um, three poems, and I wrote the music for them. The first one um, is called uh, Carpe Diem, and it's all about the concept of uh, Carpe Diem, living the moment, um, and all of this. But it's very cleverly written because it's all about the, uh, you know, the last few years with the financial uh, crash and, you know, the, the crisis and all of that. But, you know, uh, he mixes that concept with actually, you know, it doesn't really matter at the end of the day, you know. And it sounds a little bit cheesy, but it's, you know, it's not, it's not really, it's, it's written very nicely. The second one um, is called Languages, and it's a very um, surreal poem. He, actually, the, he wrote that poem listening to us. <laughs> uh, I sent him Pandora's Box, the piece we played earlier in the concert, and he just couldn't believe what he had. So he wrote what he thought, you know, the, the music was saying to to his brain and, and, and his ideas um, came to, to, to life and, and it's rather nice actually. And the third one is a lullaby, um, which is based again on some music I wrote when, I, when my first child was born. Um, and it's called Lullaby for a Moose. And the poem in Spanish is called uh, um, Cancion de Cuna para un Alte. <clears throat> so we don't have Pepe tonight, um, but I obviously can't do the poem and play the chamon at the same time. Um, so we've got someone um, who I met uh, a long time ago. I, I go every year to my, to my region, Na uh, Navarre, <coughs> and I do a little some master class and I meet the students there and it's really nice. And one of them is now studying at the Royal Academy of Music here. Uh, he's been here for two years. Um, it's Alberto who's going to do the points for us tonight. So please, a big applause for Alberto. <laughs> cada instante como si fuera el último. Anula tantos planes de futuro con los que te engañaron esos viles banqueros que han creado una crisis para hacer caja y se han congelado viles, insisto, su salario mensual de medio millón de euros. <risa> Porque siempre habrá un cerdo que te pedirá réditos, hasta por las decepciones que has vivido. El 
presente, solo el presente vale, pero vívelo de modo que, cuando te pidan cuentas, puedas contarles detalladamente todo lo que te llevas por delante. Nunca olvides que el ahorro de un año se gasta en un minuto de tristeza. Languages. Today I feel sweetly Hoy me siento dulcemente extraño. No sé si ha sido al intentar abrir o al cerrar los ojos. Me he dado cuenta de que no tenía párpados y han empezado a transitar por ellos gentes de todas las razas. Mis dientes sanos masticaban comida para niños famélicos y parias desdentados, mientras en mi frente se ha abierto un agujero por donde, con toda parsimonia, entraban y salían todas las ideas no violentas. Mientras tanto, mi lengua era capaz de hablar multitud de idiomas llamados a mi boca con una dicción tan melosa que han entendido todo sin necesidad de estudiar sus gramáticas. Y cerca de mí, Shakespeare y Cervantes dialogaban animadamente sobre el alcance del infinito de las palabras sin fronteras. A lo lejos se escuchaba una música como de jazz. Pero al acercarme he comprobado que dentro de aquel jazz sonaban todas las músicas del mundo. En estos momentos no quiero saber si estoy dormido o despierto, porque en esta extrañeza apasionada en la que vivo, mis sentidos se encuentran desbordados por todos los lenguajes que me hablan de amor. La luna escribe silencios 
sobre calostros de madre, mientras el alce descubre una música que nace con percusiones de hojas y arpegios de piano y sauce. En tanto, el viento en las ramas sopla tambores de sangre. Thank <laughs> you. 